So welcome everyone to the uh, Rosenbluth Lecture 2018. Uh, my name is uh, Mark Lee. I'm an economist with the Canadian Center for Policy Alternatives in the, in the BC office. And uh, it's a pleasure to have you all here tonight um, for the 2018 Rosenbluth Lecture featuring uh, Mark Jacobson from Stanford University. Um, this is a kind of a special one for me because, you know, I've been working on uh, climate change and energy issues for uh, over a decade now, and uh, Mark's probably the closest someone comes to being like a climate hero uh, for me. So back when I was uh, first starting out on the Climate Justice Project, um, Mark's work came on the cover of a Scientific American um, uh, magazine in November 2009 with this ambitious plan to power the world with 100% wind, water, and solar power. And so we were in very early days of the climate justice project at that time, which was figuring out how BC could get to a you know zero carbon or 100% renewable economy and trying to think through all the social justice issues attached to that. But even just that fundamental question, could we actually get uh, to 100% uh, renewables, uh, wasn't entirely clear. And and so uh, Mark's work kind of gave me uh, an intellectual scaffolding to, to, to hang on. And I actually uh, used a screenshot of that cover uh, for a number of years in my presentations when talking about the possibilities uh, around uh, what we could do uh, with our, our economy. Um, so that foundational work, I think, is, uh, was really important in, in my work. And I think it's really important now in British Columbia as we wrestle with climate and energy policies from developing a new climate action plan to uh, things like liquefied natural gas uh, and a whole bunch of other uh, related issues. So um, before we get started, I'd like to first acknowledge that we are on the traditional territory of the Musqueam, tsleil and Squamish people. Uh, we're here today in memory of Gideon Rosenbluth, uh, who passed away in August 2011. So this is now the seventh annual uh, Gideon Rosenbluth Memorial Lecture. Uh, Gideon was a highly respected member of the UBC Economics Department uh, and part of the economics community in Canada and around the world. He was a distinguished academic who held high standards for himself and his students. Uh, he taught and he wrote about economic theory and its application for the analysis of individual behavior, corporate organization, and government policy. Uh, he was a past president of the Canadian Economics Association, of the Canadian Association of University Teachers. Uh, he was an editor of the Canadian Journal of Economics, uh, an elected member of the UBC Senate, and a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada. Uh, Gideon's rigorous approach to scholarship and community involvement was accompanied by a commitment to social justice. Uh, he was a longtime research associate with the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives uh, and one of the founders of the CCPA's BC office, and he served on our first research advisory committee. Uh, I remember in our early days at the CCPA coming into meetings with Gideon, and, and uh, uh, his, uh, his rigor was pretty tough to bear <laughs> at times. Uh, but I think he instilled in us um, uh, a level of rigor in our approach to, uh, to, to research that has served us very well over the years as a public policy research institute. Uh, Gideon was a, a thinker in the Keynesian tradition, uh, but he also cared very much about poverty and the environment. Uh, in 2002, uh, the CCPA published a paper by Gideon and Peter Victor called Saving the Environment, How Canada Can Abolish Poverty and Unemployment Even in a No-Growth Economy. Uh, that showed in the mathematical language of, of economic modeling uh, how these uh, you know, seemingly intractable problems uh, could actually be accomplished. So with the support of the Rosenbluth family, who's uh, here with us in the crowd tonight, uh, Vera and Robin and Jonathan and Karina, uh, Gideon's legacy lives on. Um, in addition to the lecture, uh, the CCPA hosts an annual Rosenbluth internship. Uh, this year, a VS Saran uh, worked uh, in, in our office this summer with Seth Klein, uh, looking at proportional representation. And uh, with Seth, he uh, co-published a series uh, on proportional representation for our Policy Note blog. Uh, so if you know someone who might be a good candidate, uh, perhaps yourself, a uh, call for proposals goes out in the new year. Uh, please sign on to our e-newsletter and you won't miss it. And you'll also get regular updates on our ongoing research work. Uh, the other legacy of, the, of, of Gideon is the Gideon Rosenbluth Memorial Lecture, and we are so pleased um, to host this event in partnership with UBC's Vancouver School of Economics, and the chair of that department, uh, David Green, is here, who also sits on our research advisory committee. 
Uh, so to introduce um, Mark, I'd like to bring up Shannon Dobb. Uh, she is the Associate Director at the CCPA's BC Office, but as of next week, on November 1st, she will be our new BC Office Director uh, as Seth Klein steps down. So maybe give Seth a hand for that and give Shannon a hand. But uh, I've, had the, I've had the privilege of working with Shannon for, for 20 years now. Uh, and she's a, a huge part of the success of uh, CCPA's BC office, uh, but also an intellectual powerhouse in her own right. Uh, she is currently the co-director of the Corporate Mapping Project, uh, a SHRC-funded partnership with the University of Victoria, uh, examining the political and economic influence of the fossil fuel industry in Western Canada, so very much linked to the topics we're thinking about tonight. Uh, the Corporate Mapping Project has put out some amazing research, uh, including a report last week looking at who owns Canada's fossil fuel sector, uh, last month, they put out a report looking at the holdings of the BC Investment Management Corporation, who invest on behalf of the public sector workers for their retirement, far too often in fossil fuels, as it turns out. So there's a lot more from the Corporate Mapping Project that you can check out. All of it's available um, at corporatemapping.ca, uh, so please check it out. It's really important work. And over to you, Shannon. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. Thanks, and thanks, you, thanks to everyone for being here tonight. Is the volume okay for, for folks? I'm not quite as loud as Mark, but I, I, ca I can shout it out if I need to. Um, so I'm really excited for this uh, talk tonight, um, in large part because I think we all know that if you spend a lot of time thinking about climate change and you spend a lot of time looking at the issues, it's very easy to end up um, with uh, what I, think I read one time uh, someone referred to as apocalypse fatigue. Um, you know, it can be depressing and uh, difficult to see the possibility for uh, change sufficient to actually get us to where we need to be to avoid uh, catastrophic climate impacts. So uh, that's one of the reasons I'm excited to hear from Mark tonight is because um, this isn't just uh, hopeful in spirit. This is hopeful in the sense of providing rigorous, clear, uh, evidence to support the claim that in fact we can actually uh, avoid the worst impacts of climate change if we uh, take the need for transition to renewables seriously. So it's a great privilege to be able to introduce Mark uh, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, his background uh, before I hand the podium over to him. So Mark is a professor of civil and environmental engineering at Stanford University. His career is focused on better understanding air pollution and global uh, warming problems and developing large-scale clean renewable energy solutions to them. Uh, as Mark, as the other Mark mentioned, uh, a 2009 Scientific American cover article featured a plan by Mark Jacobson, Jacobson and Mark DeLucci to, oh my, it's a confluence of Marks, uh, to power the world with 100% uh, renewable energy. Uh, so no tricks like nuclear power, carbon capture, uh, or bio biomass, just uh, wind, solar, uh, and uh, water technologies. And while politics have been slow to pick up on this message, it's a compelling one for our fossil, fuel, fossil fueled era that is adding carbon to the atmospheric record rates. Mark's work tells us that there is another pathway to meeting our energy needs without undermining the future, one that is better for our health and our economy. In 2011, Mark co founded the Solutions Project, a nonprofit that combines science, business, and culture to educate the public about 100% clean energy roadmaps. In 2013, his group developed individual wind, water, solar energy plans for each of the 50 United States, each of 50 United States, and in 2017 for 139 countries uh, of the world. They calculated down to the number of wind tur turbines and solar arrays that would be needed in each jurisdiction, along with estimates of the number of jobs that would be created. Mark's research has had an influence on thinking about renewables in U.S. politics. The 50 state roadmaps were the primary scientific justification for legislation mandating full or partial transitions to renewable energy in California, Hawaii, Vermont, and New York. They were also the primary scientific justification behind several congressional bills calling for 100% clean renewable energy in the U.S. by 2050 and served as the basis for energy platforms of three uh, presidential candidates in 2016. In Canada, one of the arguments we hear most often in response to the call to even begin, even to be able to say to th what we should be thinking about winding down fossil fuel industries is the claim that we can't possibly make the transition to renewable energy quickly or at all. 
And here in BC, as we grapple with LNG and developing a new climate plan, you can see why we wanted to bring Mark in to share his research and wisdom with us. So please join me in Mark, Mark, welcoming Mark. Over to you. Thank you, Shannon, for that kind introduction. And thank you, Mark, as well, and for the CCPA for inviting me here and the Rosenbluth family for uh, setting up this lecture. So I am going to talk about transitioning cities, states, countries, and the world to 100% clean and renewable energy, something we need and it has to happen very quickly for the reasons I'll discuss. But let me just uh, just point out, I'll start off before I, oops, before I go to, um, I get used to the slide shifter here. Uh, before I start going into the justification, uh, we are pretty happy because just a couple months ago, California passed uh, a law, SB 100, which mandated that the state go to 60% renewable, clean and renewable electricity by 2030 and effectively 100% by 2045 in the electric power sector. And that was the justification for that. The scientific justification for that was this paper that we did in 2014 that was co-authored by about 25 people or so that uh, really said how, uh, laid out how California could go to 100% for all energy sectors. And uh, the body of work I'm gonna talk about today has really been developed over the last 10 years by over 85 researchers and students and has been reviewed by lots of people as well. And so it's, it's something that we've been improving upon over and over again. But I want to talk about here is kind of the justification and then what's been happening as a result of these plans. Uh, okay. So first of all, why do we care about this issue? From my point of view, I got into this field because I, as a teenager, I was really interested in trying to understand and solve uh, air pollution problems and also climate problems, although climate wasn't a, as big of an issue back then. But I just wanted to see, well, why should people live in the presence of air pollution. Air pollution kills worldwide four to seven million people each year, and including about 60 to 65,000 in the United States each year, and around the order of 20 to 30,000 in Canada. And there are millions more people who become ill due to cardiovascular disease, respiratory illness, complications from asthma. But based on statistical cost of life and morbidity, the cost of air pollution worldwide today is on the order of 20 to 25 trillion dollars per year. Global warming is growing in, in its cost and its effects on society and it's expected to cost on the order of 25 to $30 trillion per year worldwide by 2050. And then energy security is the third problem we're trying to address simultaneously. Um, no matter, you know, even if the cost were the same of uh, fossil fuels and renewables, fossil fuels are limited resources. They will run out at some point, which time you'll have social, economic, and political instability. And so to avoid that, we do need to transition eventually, uh, if for no other reason, just for energy stability point of view, to clean renewable energy, where there are effectively, not, I wouldn't say inexhaustible, but uh, we can use a lot more before we run out. Sorry. Okay. I'm going to get used to this in a second. Okay, so what's the idea here? Uh, the idea behind all these plans is to electrify everything, basically, and provide that electricity with clean, renewable energy. So, for example, for heating, well, for the main sectors of energy that we're looking at are electricity, transportation, heating, cooling, and industry. And there's also agriculture, forestry, and fishing, which can also fall under these categories, but we use similar techniques. So for transportation, for example, we convert everything to battery electric vehicles or hydrogen fuel cell or hybrids of the two. And I'll discuss those in a little more detail in a few minutes. Uh, for heating, cooling, and by the way, the hydrogen in the case of transportation would be produced from electricity by electrolysis. Uh, heating, cooling, we basically use heat pumps for all low temperature building heat. And, and that includes air heating and water heating and also heat pumps for refrigeration and air conditioning. Heat pumps use about one-fourth the energy as either gas heaters or electric resistance heaters because they move heat and cold as opposed to creating heat and cold, so they're just much more efficient. And they're just as cost competitive right now 
even for cold temperatures, uh, as your gas heater. And solar hot we water preheating in some cases, uh, along with heat pumps. For industry, we would use existing technologies, including electric arc furnaces, dielectric heaters, and induction furnaces. These are existing technologies. And we provide all, these, all the energy for these electric devices with wind and water and solar power. So onshore and offshore wind, solar photovoltaics on rooftops and in power plants, concentrated solar power, geothermal power, tidal and wave power to some degree, and existing hydroelectric power uh, to the extent we won't want to build more. And then, well, I'm going to just show some examples of some of these technologies uh, quickly. And so these are existing electric induction furnaces that can be used for high temperature processes in industry and electric arc furnaces. So you know, these are existing technologies. In fact, they're used in about one third of the industry in the United States already. It's just we have to transition the other two thirds uh, to these, to these uh, machines and then use clean renewable electricity to power them. Uh, for transportation, as I mentioned, battery electrics and some hydrogen fuel cell. The hydrogen fuel cell will be primarily for long distance transportation. And, but even for long distance trucks, uh, Tesla now has a semi that uh, is electric, pure electric. Nikola One has a semi that's hydrogen fuel cell. And there are lots of buses on the street already that are electric or hydrogen fuel cell, like these two examples. In fact, I think China is putting, replacing, I think it's on the order of 60,000 buses a, a month uh, with electrics right now. Um, we are actually looking at transitioning military equipment as well. So I have a student who's working on, he's from the Army, he's working on transitioning all the Army, uh, not only vehicles, but uh, uh, like tanks and marine vessels and air, aircraft and rail. And the interesting thing is, well, especially for Army vehicles, you need to have a similar volume at, for the current, as the current vehicles because they're designed to go in certain bridges and tunnels and uh, on certain uh, transport ships, for example, so they can't be actually larger. So we're trying to design them uh, such that they have the same volume. They might be a little bit heavier, or a little bit lighter, but this shows that for all these vehicles that are shown in the center, the actual the, the mass ratio of a battery electric vehicle compared to the current fossil fuel is not that it's only within 15 to 20 percent at the worst, and whereas the volume ratio is actually almost the same uh, for all these. And now if you use hydrogen fuel cell, Vehicles that for all these, the hydrogen fuel cell uh, are mostly less mass and also a little less volume, although in one case it's a little more volume. So it's pretty close. It's, it indicates that you can transition all these types of transport and, and, and vehicles to battery electrics and hydrogen fuel cell. We've looked at 747s for commercial aircraft as well and also you know, other and helicopters and uh, all types of vehicles, you can do it. It's, a, it's possible, and it is being done to some degree for a lot of things. On the left here is an electric aircraft that's already in the sky, but it's only for a couple people, but it can go up to 1,500 kilometers. It's expected, though, there are several startup companies that are building commercial aircraft that'll seat 50 to 100 people to go up to 1,500 kilometers that are pure electric. And then on the bottom right is a hydrogen fuel cell aircraft that goes 1,500 kilometers right now that seats four people. Uh, but you know, the, all rockets and the space shuttles were propelled into space by hydrogen. And this is an example on the top right of a hydrogen uh, aircraft that, uh, it's a drawing, it's not an actual one, but uh, it will probably have a larger volume, but it will probably weigh less due to the fact that uh, hydrogen is a lot lighter than jet fuel. But so these are technologies that are here. Just to give some examples of other technologies, this, a startup is building this as a vertical take, takeoff and landing. Uh, to replace a helicopter, or you could just use a helicopter that's and replace it with batteries, but this is a new technology. So uh, these technologies are taking off and they're starting to become more widespread pretty rapidly. And just, just your typical uh, machines, like you know, everybody hates a leaf blower because it's not only noisy, but it smells. But now you have electric leaf blowers that are quiet and they don't smell because they run on electricity. And lawnmowers, the same thing. They're electric versions. And also forklifts, they're, they're now electric versions. So this is a transition that is necessary and that's already occurring to some degree. Now, a couple other big breakthroughs are floating offshore wind turbines and floating offshore solar. Uh, floating offshore solar is particularly useful for 
uh, land-constrained countries such as Singapore that are, you know, have high population density and very little land. Uh, Gibraltar is another place. But there are also other places that you can put water, uh, floating turbines on lakes that are to, to reduce evaporation as well. But it's just another uh, location that you can put solar to avoid having to use too much land for it. Floating offshore wind, it's really big because, well, first of all, there's, there's one existing floating offshore wind farm that's offshore of Scotland right now, and it has a capacity factor of 67%. It's been operating over, I think, over a year and a half or something like that, which is incredible. I mean, tip, the average capacity factor of onshore wind turbines in the United States of new ones is around 33 or 34%. And it used to be that the capacity factors were 20%, uh, that maybe 15 years ago, 20 years ago. But offshore, there's so much wind, especially and you can, with floating turbines, you can send them further offshore that people don't see them and don't complain about them. And so in fact, now that, well right now, there's only one offshore wind farm in the US and there are none in Canada, but there are a lot that are being uh, proposed and permitted right now offshore both the East Coast and the West Coast. So California, because it has mandated 100% clean renewable energy by 2045 and 60% by 2030, it's actually now starting to look at permitting uh, floating offshore wind. It's going straight to the floating offshore wind because California's coast, like, uh, like off British Columbia, is pretty steep pretty quickly. And so it's not like the East Coast where you have shallow water out to 200 miles. Uh, here it's deep, so you need floating offshore for if you want to put a lot of wind. But you can actually power you know, two-thirds of California just with floating offshore wind uh, you know, not going out very far. So this is a really big breakthrough and cost of offshore wind has gone down significantly. It's on the order of seven cents a kilowatt hour now. It used to be just two years ago, it was like 15, 14 cents a kilowatt hour. So the costs have just dropped tremendously. Onshore wind in the US is now the cheapest form of electric power by far. It's on the order of two to three cents a kilowatt hour subsidized and about three to four cents a kilowatt hour unsubsidized. So and solar is this, uh, at the utility scale, is the second cheapest form of electricity right now in the US. And then gas is third. It's, a, it's about six to seven cents a kilowatt hour. Okay, so we'll need storage though because the wind doesn't always blow, the sun does not always shine. So we want to um, store not only electricity but heat and cold as well. And it turns out that because we're electrifying a lot of the heating and cooling, uh, that will have more flexible loads and we're electrifying transportation will have more what are called flexible loads and I'll get into that in a bit. But the types of storage that we're going to use is uh, for electricity we'd use concentrated solar power with storage. So concentrated solar power is where you have uh, sunlight focusing off of mirrors onto a central tower to heat a fluid. The fluid gets really really hot and gets stored and it can get stored in a tank and so you can store it overnight. And then when you want to generate electricity, you run the fluid by water to boil the water to create steam to run a steam turbine to generate electricity. So the concentrated solar power with storage, it's a way to just provide solar energy 24 hours a day uh, because you have this hot storage tank. With photovoltaics, uh, you can't do the same thing except you, you can do it with batteries. So photovoltaics are paired with batteries, whereas concentrated solar is is paired with thermal energy storage. But anyway, so that's a type of storage. Pumped hydroelectric is where you have two reservoirs, a lower and an upper one. When you have too much electricity, you pump water up the hill into the upper reservoir. When you need electricity, you let water drain down the hill through a turbine to generate electricity. So this, there are a lot of pumped hydro storage facilities around the world. Uh, and f Los Angeles is actually planning to, has a, in fact, they already have a plan, they're, they're, they're already starting this plan to spend three to four billion dollars to turn Hoover Dam, Dam into a giant pumped storage facility. So Lake Mead, which is right behind Hoover Dam, is the upper reservoir, and then 20 miles downstream, there's another lake, is the lower reservoir. So instead of just letting the water flow once through the turbines, they're gonna have pipes go underground from this, the downstream lake, lake to the upstream lake and recycle the water and then use it because we're having so many so much renewables added to California that this will allow the uh, grid to stay stable. It'll help the grid stay stable because when you don't have any wind or solar you can then allow water to drain down uh, Hoover Dam and produce power. 
So that's another type of storage. Uh, and then existing hydroelectric dams, those are basically giant batteries, except that you can't recharge them except for naturally. You, uh, but you can discharge them pretty much instantaneously. So they're used for peaking power quite a bit right now, and batteries themselves. And then heating, cooling, storage in water, ice, and rocks. And I'll show you examples of that in a second. And then also hydrogen is a form of storage. So when you have excess wind or solar, you can use it to produce hydrogen. And that could then be used for transportation when you need it. And then demand response is a technique where uh, utilities give people incentives to use electricity at certain times of the day and not to use electricity at certain times of the day. And that is actually also used to try to con balance supply and demand on the grid. So let me just do some examples of here's cold storage, or ice storage, that is. Uh, Stanford, my university, had a big ice cube under a building from 1998 to 2017. And at night, when the electricity price was low, uh, electricity was used to produce ice. And then during the day, instead of uh, using air conditioning to cool the buildings, uh, water was run through the coils in the ice and then sent to buildings. And the wa cold water chilled the buildings. So this was, a like, this was like electricity storage because it avoided electricity use, but it wasn't. Uh, it cost about $38 a kilowatt hour, whereas batteries cost well, at the time, they cost around four or $500 a kilowatt hour. Now they're down to around 200 to $300 a kilowatt hour. So ice storage is actually pretty common. It's used under stadiums and hospitals quite a bit, but not that many people know about it. But it's something that you can actually expand and use quite a bit more uh, with a clean renewable energy system. Uh, this is a, an example of underground thermal energy storage in rocks. Uh, this is a community, Okotoks, which is an hour south of Calgary. And in 2004 and 5, uh, there were 52 homes built with solar collectors on their roofs, on the top left, uh, well, on the roofs of the garages. And in their solar collectors is a glycol solution. And during the long summer days, the solution is heated by the sun. And then the solution is piped to a building on the right here, where the heat is transferred to water in pipes. The water is then piped under this field. And the field was excavated and filled with rocks and pipes for the water to go through. And so the water then uh, passes by the rocks, transfers its heat to the rocks, and the rocks heat up to about 80 degrees Celsius. And that heat is then stored there for up to six months until winter when the snow is on the ground and the whole system is run in reverse and provides 100% of the heat for these 52 homes in the wintertime, in fact, all year round. And, uh, so this kind of storage, the storage component here costs less than $1 a kilowatt hour, but it's thermal, it's heat storage, not electricity storage, compared to $200 to $300 a kilowatt hour for battery electric storage right now. So this is something that you could do on a large scale. This is a form of what's called district heat. And so Denmark has 60% of its heating of buildings is district heat, but it's different type. It's of what in water tanks, and it's for short term, like up to a week. But you can do the same thing. You can use rocks, or you can use big caverns of water, or underground, or big cisterns you can put underground of water, or some other type of material. It doesn't have to be rocks. But it's you know combining heat storage with electricity storage and electrifying everything. It just makes it turns out to make it much easier to match power demand and supply on the grid. Uh, so here's another example. I'm proud to say Stanford uh, has committed to be 100% clean renewable electricity for all its uh, campus operations by 2021. Uh, right now, it's about 68%. And it'll also be 100% renewable in terms of its transportation that it controls by 2025 and 100% greenhouse gas free by then as well. And what it's done, well, OK, so there was a big natural gas cogeneration plant right outside my office for several years. And I had to look at it every day and see the, the smoke. And well, it's really steam with a lot of ammonia and other junk being emitted every day. But it was bulldozed two years ago and replaced with these two boilers and a chiller and an elaborate piping system. So on the right, you can see the cold and heat demand of the university during the year. So on the left is uh, January and the right is December. So the bright blue is the cold demand, which, is the, which peaks in the summer. And the bright red is the heat demand, which peaks in the winter. 
But as you can see, there's both heat and cold demand all year, different parts of the university. And the darker shades, well, whenever you produce cold, you release heat. And when you produce heat, you release cold. So usually that's wasted. But if you actually capture that and then send it back to these tanks, these hot, two hot water tanks and a chiller, a cold water tank, then you can store that heat and cold and then ship it around the university to different places. So this combined with 50 megawatts, sorry, 60 megawatts of solar that was installed in the Mojave Desert uh, allowed the university to eliminate 68% of its greenhouse gas footprint uh, two, like two years ago. And now it's by, it just bought 72 more megawatts in the desert that will be installed in 2021. And once that's done, it'll be 100%. Uh, renewable, the first campus in the world to be 100% renewable. Uh, University of Hawaii has a goal to do that, but I think it was by 2045. And uh, a few other campuses, Berkeley is trying to go to, uh, I don't know, they have some goal, but it's also not until 2025. So anyway, it's good that a lot of campuses are moving towards renewables, but it's possible you don't need gas to power a campus or a city or anything else, because there are ways around it. So to that end, I want to show you how I transitioned my own home to no gas and all electric and showed it. And, uh, and that's for transportation and heating, cooling, and everything else. So I built a home that I moved into about a year and a half ago on the campus. And so there's no gas on the property. So everything, all the appliances are electric. So for heating, for air and water heating, I have heat pumps. So this is a heat pump. It's called a ductless mini split uh, heat pump, air conditioner and air heater. And what it does, it doesn't produce heat or cold. It moves it around. So there's an outside unit, which, uh, and there's an inside unit in each zone of the house. So the inside of the unit looks like that. It's kind of on the roof. And so when it's hot in the room and you want to cool it down, you basically blow the hot air from the room over these coils and the heat gets transferred to uh, coolant and pipes, and the coolant brings the heat outside and expels the heat to the air outside. So it just moves the heat outside. It doesn't create or destroy heat. Conversely, when you want to bring heat into the house, you do the same thing. You extract heat out of the air from the outside. It goes into the coolant. The coolant moves into the to these units, and then uh, the air from blows over the warm coolant, and the warm air gets exp expelled into the room. So this just moves heat around. It uses one-fourth the energy as other types of heating or cooling, uh, either electric resistance heater or a gas heater or a typical air conditioner. And it's really, it really works well. I mean, the temperature is perfect all year round. Never, I mean, it's just no matter how, how cold or hot it is outside, it's always a perfect temperature in the house. Uh, this is the same thing for water heating. Uh, this is a heat pump water heater. So it doesn't run on gas. It runs on just plugged into the wall. And this is it, except for some pipes. And uh, it extracts, in this case, the heat is extracted from the room. So the room is slightly, this is in a mechanical room. So the room is a couple degrees cooler than the outside, which is fine in the summer because I then open the door and it provides extra air conditioning for the rest of the house. But it's really efficient. Again, it uses one fourth the energy as a gas heater or, or uh, electric resistance heater. And then for stoves, instead of a, a gas stove, this is an electric induction cooktop stove. And it uh, boils water in half the time as gas. And then when you touch it, it doesn't feel hot, even when it's boiling water, because it's not heating up. You don't heat up the stove. It actually excites molecules in the pot. And because you have to have an iron pot, uh, and it excites molecules and heats the pot itself due to resistance heating. And then the pot itself gets hot, but the stove stays cool. So it looks pretty nifty. There's no flame, no danger. It seems to work really well. And it cooks, and a lot of chefs are turning to it. The reason a lot of people like gas stoves is because you can control the temperature. But you can control the temperature of this really well, too. And so a lot of restaurants are shifting to induction cooktops as well. And then on the roof, there's solar photovoltaics uh, to, tr to provide electricity uh, for the whole house. And in the garage, there are batteries. There are I have four batteries, but actually my utility only allowed me to turn two of them on. So I'm, everything I'm showing you is, is only with two batteries, and uh, which is actually turns out to be fine because if I had the other two batteries, I'd probably actually uh, waste money because I'd be 
I'd be putting electricity in the batteries when the electricity price is high and then using it when it's low, when, uh, when you really want to do the reverse because, well, anyway, it's, it's complicated, but it, it turns out it's a little more economic to just use two batteries, but when two of the batteries die, I can turn on the other two. <laughs> and then I have electric cars to uh, uh, drive, and actually my son has an electric car, so there are three electric cars are charged here, and the charging is, you know, works really well. And so I'm going to show you some results for the house for one year. Uh, but first, of, well, first I'm going to show you one week. This is one week in the summer and kind of explain how this operates. So the green is solar production from the roof. And so in the morning, the first thing that the solar photovoltaics do is they power devices in the house. And then once those are satisfied, uh, then it'll fill the battery because so down here this is the battery storage and it's from zero to a hundred percent and the lowest is fifty percent because remember two batteries are shut off or they're not operating so th that's the other fifty percent so at night well at night the battery drains or it's being used so it could go down to fifty percent of supply so the first thing that happens in the morning after the home electricity is satisfied with the solar the solar then charges the battery so the battery goes up to 100% storage and then stays uh, charged all day. And then once the sun goes down at night, uh, then the battery kicks in and starts providing electricity for the house. So the light blue uh, is during the day is electricity use for the home or the battery. And the dark blue is electricity use from the battery itself at night. And you can see that pretty much most nights there's only battery use. The red is grid electricity. And the main two spikes where the grid electricity is used when I'm charging the cars. And so those require a really fast discharge rate and they require a lot of energy as well. And so right now the batteries can't supply that high discharge rate. I could, for this car, I could if I had all four batteries, but I don't. And uh, for this one, I would need more batteries to get that high peak discharge rate. Nevertheless, even during this week, um, I supplied twice as much electricity to the grid as I uh, used. And then I'm going to show you, uh, this is a full year of energy use. So during the year, I, I generated 120% of the electricity that I used. And so I had no gas bill, no electric bill, no gasoline bill for three cars that we had. And I got a check back from my utility for $528. And that's because there's, in California and also a lot of places, uh, they have these new utilities that have cropped up that take over the generation portion of your bill. They're called community choice aggregation utilities. And the one I have is called Silicon Valley Clean Energy. And what they do is, so I still have an underlying utility for transmission distribution, which is PG&E, Pacific Gas and Electric. So they still um, would bill you for your transmission distribution uh, for when you're actually using electricity, if you're using electricity more than you're giving back to them. But they would only pay two cents a kilowatt hour for the excess electricity that I generated. Whereas these community choice aggregation uh, utilities will pay you at the time of use. So in this case, up to 28 cents a kilowatt hour. And so that's why, I, otherwise I'd get a check for $10 from PG&E. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, so it's it's really a cool thing. There are now 18 of these CCAs in California, and I think there are like 60 of them throughout the U.S., and I, I don't know if they've spread to Canada yet, but they're really cool things because what they do is they actually, and plus, even if you don't have your own solar, uh, you can choose with a CCA to go to 100% renewables because they actually purchase wind farms and solar farms or purchase the power from them and to actually supply to you. So they can guarantee you 100% or 90% or whatever you choose. Uh, of renewable energy. And the cost, if you go on their plan, is virtually the same as if it were a fossil fuel. It's like within 0.002 cents a kilowatt hour. Now, I, but I want to show you the real savings of this. So, I, because, well, I built the home from scratch, so it wasn't a remodel in this case. But I avoided, up front, in my case, I avoided $6,000 of a gas hookup fee just to, because the utility, PG&E, wanted to charge me $6,000 just to hook up the gas from the edge of my property to my property, which was two inches. And I asked them, <laughs> I asked them well, why, why are you charging $6,000? And they said, well, everybody in PG&E has to take a cut. 
<laughs> so, <laughs> there, was a, no, there was no actual explanation for why. There's, there's no reason for it, except it's an opportunity for them to charge new homeowners. So anyway, on average, it's between three and $8,000. These numbers are for general homeowners. And then I avoided another $6,000 in pipes, and the range would be one to $7,000. So you can avoid four to $13,000, four to $15,000 up front if you're building a new home just by not having gas on your property. But then, you know, an average person will have an electric bill of one to $3,000, a gas bill of one to three, and a vehicle bill of one to $4,000. So the overall savings is four to uh, $15,000 up front plus about three to $10,000 per year. Now with this and with uh, the fact that uh, there are subsidies in, in the U.S. for solar and wind of 30% tax credit, the payback time is five to six years for this whole system. And the solar panels are warranted for 25 years. So it's a no-lose situation if you're going to, as long as you're going to be there five years, but even then you can sell the, and probably make some money to the next person you sell it to. If there were no subsidies, it would be about 10 years. So it's, it's really worthwhile, in California at least, to do this. Uh, the sun is really good. I mean, here in British Columbia, I understand, I mean, obviously, this solar is probably not as good as in California, but it's still pretty good, especially in, in the summer. You even have longer days. So anyway, it's, it's, I'd say there's now a law in California that all new homes as of 2020 have to have enough solar on their roof to power their home power to be net zero carbon in the annual average. And so this is nice, that should be a law everywhere. It would also be good if there was a law to not allow natural gas on new homes or new buildings. That would be really cool. Okay, so now let's talk about transitioning kind of the world to 100% clean and renewable energy. We developed plans for 139 countries of the world and uh, to see if it's possible, technically and economically feasible to do a transition. So uh, these numbers are for the summation over all 139 countries. And the 2012 power demand in these countries, the end use power demand was 12.1 trillion watts. And that's for all sectors of energy. And that's expected to, go to grow to about 21 terawatts in 2050. However, if we electrify all energy sectors and provide that electricity with clean renewable energy, if we do it without heat pumps, we go down in pow to power demand of 11.8 terawatts, or around a 43% reduction of demand by 2050. If we add heat pumps to replace all low temperature heating and cooling, uh, we'd go down to 8.6 terawatts. So that's a 58% reduction of demand without changing our habits very much. And this breaks down how we get that reduction. 23 percentage points of that 58 is due to the efficiency of electricity over combustion. For example, an electric car, 80 to 86 percent of the electricity in the car goes to move the car, and the rest is waste heat. But a gasoline car, only 17 to 20 percent of the energy in the gasoline goes to move the car. So you reduce your power demand by a factor of four to five by going to an electric car. But averaged over all energy sectors, that's 23 percent reduction of demand. Now, another 13% of energy used worldwide is used just to mine, transport, and refine fossil fuels and uranium. And if you eliminate fossil fuels and uranium, then you can save 13% of all energy because wind comes right to the turbine, solar comes right to the panel. You don't need to go uh, dig for it. And then 16% is due to the efficiency of heat pumps. If you averaged over all those energy sectors, if you use heat pumps for all low temperature heating and cooling, and then there's another 7% for efficiency beyond what's expected in the business as usual case in 2050. And these are just excess energy efficiency measures that uh, individuals can take or appliances, um, more LED lights, weatherizing your home, uh, bicycling more, things like that, better, more efficient trans public transportation. So 58%, that's important because that means even if the cost per unit energy is the same between fossil fuels and renewables in terms of, let's say they're both 10 or 11 cents a kilowatt hour, there are 50% fewer kilowatt hours in the wind, water, solar case. So it's half the actual cost to consumers. So let's look at, well, this is for Canada. Uh, this is our energy plan, how you could actually power Canada for all purposes 
for electricity, transportation, heating, cooling, industry, agriculture, forestry, and fishing uh, in 2050. It would be 27.5% onshore wind, 23% offshore wind, 5% residential rooftop PV, 9% commercial government rooftop PV, 7% solar PV power plants, almost 10% CSP power plants, 2% geothermal, 15% hydro, and 0.2% tidal, and 2.2% wave. And this is just one mix. I mean, there are many possible mixes, it turns out, but it's just one that works. Uh, but it shows on the right the numbers of these devices, and I'll get, I don't want to dwell on that for right now, but you'll notice the hydro plants, it says zero. That's the number of new devices, so it doesn't count what's existing. So this just, on the right is the number of new devices uh, that you need beyond what's already there. And, but so without even adding any new hydro, hydro would count for 14.5% of all Canadian energy for all purposes in 2050. Now, Worldwide, this, this is for all 139 countries, which represent about 99% of all emissions worldwide. It would be 23.5% onshore wind, 14% offshore, 16% residential rooftop PV, 12% commercial government rooftop PV, 20% PV power plants, 10% CSP power plants, 1% geothermal, 4% hydro, uh, and then 1%, less than 1% tidal plus wave. And you can see the numbers of devices. Now, worldwide, we'd need about 2.6 million turbines. You might think, oh, that's a lot of wind turbines. That's, but that's worldwide. Uh, I just want to point out that, well, uh, I'll come to the f comparison to the fossil fuel infrastructure in a second. But the land area required for this whole thing for the world, <coughs> it's, well, offshore, there's no land. So tidal wave, offshore wind don't count for, any, for no new land. Uh, rooftop PV does not require new land. There's no new hydro, and there's no, there's hardly any additional geothermal. So it's all utility PV and CSP plus onshore wind. So the utility PV plus CSP would be about one fifth of one percent of the world's land area, and the onshore wind, which is spacing between wind turbines, is 0.92 uh, percent. So that's open space that can be used for agriculture, rangeland, farmland open space, or you could put the solar on the wind land as well. That's how open space it is. So, but take the number, the sum of those two is 1.14% of the world's land. Okay, does that sound, that sounds like a lot, but, okay, here's the land area required for the fossil fuel infrastructure in the United States and California. And just, well, on the top, uh, all the numbers here are the numbers of these different things. So, active oil and gas wells, there are 1.2 million active oil and gas wells every, in the U.S., and there are 50,000 new ones drilled every year. There are 2.6 million inactive ones. There are 550, oh, sorry, that's oil wells, abandoned oil wells. There are 550,000 abandoned gas wells, 1,500 coal mines, 135 oil refineries, 1.6 million miles of pipeline, of gas pipeline, 161,000 miles of oil pipeline, 3,300 uh, power plants, 115,000 gas stations, 394. Uh, gas storage facilities, they take up 1.3% of the U.S. land area and 1.7% of California's land area just from the oil and gas infrastructure. So now our 1.14% is looking pretty good. So, <laughs> so, so um, anyway, next time somebody says that the you know, wind turbines take up a huge amount of land, well, they don't take as much land as all this oil and gas. Now, and plus all that land, all that wind land of that 1.14%, you know, on the order of 80% of it is open space that can be used for multiple purposes. So, okay, so then question is, next question is, can we keep the grid stable with just clean renewable energy? So we've done grid integration studies. Well, we, for this case, we did, we broke up these 139 countries into 20 world regions, and we did a grid study for each of the 20 regions. And we looked at three different scenarios for each region. And so these are the three scenarios, and these are the types of storage that we looked at. So case A was where we had battery storage, CSP storage, heat and cold storage, no heat pumps, uh, no additional hydropower turbines, and we did have pumped hydro storage, and we did have hydrogen for transportation. The second case was the same as the first, except no batteries, also no heat pumps, but we, we added turbines to existing dams 
to allow the peak discharge rate to be higher, so you can discharge water higher, but conserving the water in the dam so you have a higher discharge for shorter periods. And then case C, we had batteries, uh, no heat and cold storage, but we had heat pumps in that case and no additional hydropower turbines. Well, in any case, all three of them, if you average over all 20 world regions, the cost of energy was pretty similar per unit energy, 10.6 to 10.7 cents a kilowatt hour. But you'll notice in the third case where we used heat pumps, we used 16% less energy than the other cases. But in all the cases, we're on the order of 50% less energy than the fossil, in the case of fossil fuels. So even if the cost of fossil fuels is about the same, we're using 50% less energy and even less energy in the heat pump case. But I just want to run through each set of each of the 20 world regions just to show you kind of more detail what we did. So the US plus Canada was one grid and uh, in this case. And what we, we ran for five years, every 30 seconds for five years, and we predicted the winds and solar fields with a climate model predicting every 30 seconds for five years throughout these countries. And then we compared the energy supply of from wind and solar and hydro and geothermal tidal wave with the demand for energy, the changes in storage and losses and shedding. And we were able to match the power demand every 30 seconds for five years. And this shows 30 days every hour, but it, we actually resolved it for 30 seconds. So this is North America, well, US plus Canada. And I just want to real quickly run through. This was uh, Central America, uh, Cuba, uh, Dominican Republic and Haiti. So we did you know, a bunch of island countries as well and regions in Jamaica, uh, South America, uh, New Zealand, uh, Australia, uh, Southeast Asia, the Philippines, oops, uh, Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, uh, China, Hong Kong, Mongolia, North Korea, <coughs> Russia and Georgia, uh, India, Nepal, Sri Lanka, uh, Central Asia, uh, the Middle East, Europe, and Iceland, <laughs> and Africa. So this was 139 countries. We were able to keep the grid stable. And just a little more detail about the cost. So if we just look at today's electric power sector worldwide, and we move that forward to 2050 and bring it back into today's dollars, that's estimated to cost 9.8 cents a kilowatt hour for fossil fuel electricity. But that's just the energy cost. The health cost is 12.7 cents a kilowatt hour. The climate cost is about 16 cents a kilowatt hour. So the total social cost, which is what economics is about, right? social cost, it was 38 cents a kilowatt hour. So it's like four times, well, three, you know, well, almost four times the direct cost of energy. Now, wind, water, solar, just replacing the business as usual electricity without electrifying all the other sectors was about 9.7 cents a kilowatt hour. So it had almost the same direct cost of energy per unit energy but one-fourth the social cost. And then since we're using 50% fewer kilowatt hours, it's really one-eighth the social cost of energy for a wind, water, solar system compared to a fossil fuel system. Now, replacing all energy sectors with wind, water, solar, it was about 10.6 cents a kilowatt hour direct energy cost. Anyway, the point is it's a lot cheaper from a social perspective and even from a direct consumer perspective uh, to go to clean renewable energy. Now. And I should mention, we also calculate the jobs in each country. And in the case of Canada, we found that we'd create 80,000 more uh, long-term full-time jobs than lost if we do this transition by 2050. Uh, so what, about, what did people think about transitioning? Uh, so there was a public opinion survey last year of, tw of 13 countries, 26,000 people, and including uh, the US and Canada. And it found that 82% of the people in all these countries combined want 100% clean renewable energy. It was really surprising to me even. But what's even more surprising is that only 66% of these people believe climate change is a serious issue. But the only good news about this is that, well, you don't have to believe in climate change to believe in clean renewable energy, which is fine. If you want to solve the problem, you don't have to believe in the problem, fine. <laughs> 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 Whatever works. <laughs> 
Well, one of the reasons is that people believe in renewable energy more than they believe in climate change as a problem is that 69% believe that uh, renewables make countries more energy independent. 73% say renewables will boost economic growth. You know, other people think that it creates jobs. So there are a lot of other economic reasons that people like renewable energy. And there's another poll that was totally independent that came up with a similar result. Uh, it's so, the question, this is only in the US and it's for seven states. It says, do you support or oppose powering all energy in the US entirely by clean and renewable sources like wind, solar, and hydroelectric by 2050? That means homes, businesses, cars, trucks, and nationwide, while well, 64% strongly supported this contention, 19% somewhat supported. So the total of those is 83% either strongly or somewhat supported the transition to 100% clean renewable energy for everything. And only 16% opposed this. And among states, it's pretty good. I mean, ironically, I mean, Iowa had the lowest uh, percentage for it, but actually Iowa has 42% of all its electricity is from wind right now. With, but it's, and it makes no effort to do it because it's so cheap. So the, they, they like the transition, but um, you know, they're still skeptics. A lot of people are still skeptical in Iowa. Okay. So we've been um, developing energy plans, as I mentioned, for 10 years. And some of the uh, impacts have, well, as was mentioned, I think Mark mentioned in the introduction that, uh, you know, the, Several, there are three presidential candidates, including Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton and Martin O'Malley, who adopted our 100% goals for the, during their, as part of their platform, election platform. But also the Democratic platform actually adopted it as part of their whole platform that, to go to 100% renewables. And there are actually five resolutions and laws pending in Congress, you wouldn't believe it, to go to 100% renewable energy that ha they have not been voted on yet. But there's House Resolution 540, Senate Resolution 632, Senate Bill 987, and House Bills 3314 and 3671. But they all mandate or requ would require the United States to go to 100% clean and renewable electricity. For example, the most recent one is the, it's called the Off Act 3671. It's, it's asking to go to 100% clean wind, water, solar energy. It defines actually all the, what's clean as just wind, water, solar and storage and efficiency, and efficiency by 2035. So that's actually a really aggressive, but it's only for electricity and transportation. It's not, in, it's not dealing with industry and home heating. So that's, you know, these are mostly, mostly for electricity, although some of them, uh, I, think, I think one of these is all for all energy as well. Now, there are also laws that have been passed. Well, Hawaii has a 100% law that was passed in 2015 for the electric power sector. California just passed, as I mentioned, uh, SB 100 to go to 100% by 2045. Vermont has a 70% law, 75% law by 2032, actually. Um, and New York has a 50% law by 2030. And Washington State on the ballot right now is, a, I think, a zero carbon or carbon-free law by 2045. That'll be voted on. Uh, but there are over 85 towns and cities uh, across North America that have committed to 100%, and I've uh, highlighted a few, and you'll recognize some of them. Uh, of course, Vancouver is an early adopter of, of the 100% uh, goals, which uh, is really great. Nelson also, Oxford County, Ontario. Uh, so, but big cities too, like Atlanta, Georgia, and uh, Madison, Wisconsin, and Portland, Oregon, and, but also small towns such as Silva and Boone, North Carolina, Abita Springs, Louisiana, and Moab, Utah, I mean, these are places you would not expect to get um, votes to get 100% renewables. In fact, there are 12 towns and counties in North Carolina alone that have voted for 100% renewables. And uh, in fact, Charlotte's going to vote pretty soon on a resolution, which is the biggest, if not one of the biggest uh, cities in North Carolina. And, whoops. Okay, so then there are over 100, I think it's actually up to 154 international companies that have made commitments to go to 100% renewables in all their operations. And you can, and these include pretty much all the major companies of the world. And Google and Apple have claimed to already have met those in the annual average. And Google, in fact, announced two weeks ago that they would want to actually meet power demand every hour. Uh, so that's their next goal, to actually meet power demand every hour for all their data centers. So this will be a big step. 
And then there are over, over 70 nonprofits that have committed to 100% clean renewable energy, and they've been driving a lot of the legislation actions uh, for this movement. Uh, well, anyway, to summarize, so these energy plans to transition the world, they would result in over around, well, around 24 million net jobs minus lost uh, worldwide. These are long-term full-time jobs. I mentioned about 80,000 in Canada, about 2 million in the United States. And they would require only 0.22% of the world's land for footprints and 0.9% for spacing, avoid 4 to 7 million air pollution deaths per year, uh, slow, then eventually reverse global warming. Uh, we think the grids can stay stable uh, if we adopt these plans. The wind, water, solar per kilowatt hour cost, the direct cost of energy is similar or less than that of fossil fuels. The energy plus health plus climate cost per kilowatt hour, one fourth that of fossil fuels. But the, the social cost, the cost to consumers, well, the social cost to consumers is one eighth of that of fossil fuels. And then finally, we think transitioning is technically and economically possible. Uh, there are social and political barriers that still need to be overcome, but the uh, solution requires collective willpower, but immediate deployment. We need like 80% by 2030 and 100% by 2050. And if you want more information, uh, these slides can be obtained at the upper link, and then the actual papers where we developed the roadmaps are at the second link. The grid integration studies are at the third link, and then there are inter infographic maps from the solution project that you can just go on and click on a country or a state and or a city, and up will pop a energy plan. And then also, if you want updates on new papers and things like that, uh, I'm on Twitter too. So thank you very much. I appreciate your attention. Thanks. <laughs>